Okay, let's get started on the review for our last unit test. Um, I don't know that I need to say anything other than let's just go get started. Okay, so let's see. We have to determine if each function is one-to-one. -one. So I've told you they're all functions, so you don't have to worry about that. But if it is one-to-one, -one, remember on a graph like A through D, it has to pass the horizontal line test. That means if a horizontal line is dragged across it, we know the vertical line test. If you draw a vertical line across the graph that it inter intersects the graph at only one place at a time. So now the horizontal line test tells us we're going to do the exact same thing with the horizontal line. So if I bring my horizontal line up this way, it touches one there, one there, one there, one there, and one there. So yes, this is one to one. Here I have one here, one here, one here, but I have a problem here where x is 3. I'm sorry, where x it, at where the y is 3, it intersects in two points, so this is no. Here, everything except the vertex of the parabola, it touches twice. So this is no. This is the square root function, and if we drag a line across a horizontal line up and down across it, it only touches in one place at a time, so yes. If I'm looking at a set of ordered pairs, no y value can be repeated. Because that tells you for an input of, of some x, sometimes it will map to one thing and sometimes to another. Okay. All right, so if I look at this, I know this is a function because all of my inputs are different. But here, I have different I have the same output. So graphically that would mean there are three po two points where the y value is 5, so this is no. Let's see. 1 2 4 5, so this is a function 2 1 5 4. Those are all different, so yes. Okay. Now, if you're looking at a function then what you have to look at is you assume that f of a equals f of b and then see if a equals b. Okay. So that tells you if the y's are the same, then the a's have to equal b. Okay. So, if I have f of a, and I want to know if it's equal to f of b, f of a would be 2a plus 5, and I want to know if that's equal to 2b plus 5. If I subtract 5 from both sides, I get 2a equals 2b, and when I divide by 2, I get a equals b, so this is yes. Here, I will do the same thing, f of a equals f of b, then a has to equal b, so f of a is 1 over a plus 2, I want to know if that's equal to 1 over b plus 2. Now I have to solve for a or b, so this is a proportion I can cross multiply, so b plus 2 is equal to a plus 2, which tells me b equals a. So, yes. Okay. All right, on the next section, it says use compositions to determine if a pair of functions is inverses. This means that if they are inverses, then f of a, excuse me, f dot g of x is equal to x and g dot f of x is equal to x. So I just have to find a composition of the two functions and if it equals x then they are inverses. If they don't equal x then the answer is no. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. 
All right, so for A, if f of x is equal to the square root of x plus 1 and g of x is equal to x squared minus 1, if I do f dot g of x, that means I'm going to take g of x and put it inside f. So that means I'm going to replace the x with that. So that becomes the square root of x squared minus 1 plus 1, which is the square root of x squared, which is x. Okay. Now I need to do it backwards. g dot f of x is g of f of x, which means now I take this and put it in here. So that becomes the square root of x plus 1 squared minus 1. Well, we know that a square root and a square undo each other. So this is x plus 1 minus 1, which is x. So the answer here is yes. Okay, for b, I have f of x is equal to 3x plus 5, and g of x is equal to x minus 5 over 3. I'm going to pull this away so we can see it better. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do f dot g of x, which means I'm going to take the g function and put it inside the f function. So this becomes 3 times x minus 5 over 3 plus 5. Okay, and here I can say, all right, well, if this is 3 over 1 times this, I can cancel out the 3s. So this becomes x minus 5 plus 5, which is x. If I have g dot f of x, then that means I'm going to put the f function inside the g function. So I'm going to take this and put it in for x. So that becomes 3x plus 5 minus 5, all divided by 3, which is 3x over 3, which is x. So the answer is yes. Oh, I'm sorry, that was c. All right, well, let's go back and do b. All right, f of x is equal to x minus 1 over 2, and g of x is x plus 2. So f dot g of x means that I'm going to put g of x inside f. So I'm going to put this here. So that gives me x plus 2 minus 1 over 2 which is x plus 1 over 2. That is not equal to x, so I can say no already. But I'm going to, just because I have to, g dot f of x means I'm going to put the f function inside of g. So this becomes x minus 1 over 2 plus 2. If I get a common denominator so I can combine these, I'm going to multiply by 2 over 2. So that gives me x minus 1 plus 4 over 2, which is x plus 3 over 2, which is not equal to x. So that confirms the no. All right, for D f of x equals 1 over x plus 5 plus 2, and g of x equals 1 over x plus 2 plus 5. Okay, so I want to do f dot g of x, which is the same thing as f of g of x. So that means I'm going to take this whole thing and put it in for x. So that gives me 1 over 1 over x plus 2 plus 5 plus 2. Okay, I'm going to have to do a little work on this one. Okay, this is 5 over 1. 
So I'm going to have to multiply by x plus 2 over x plus 2. So that gives me 1 over 1 plus 5 times x plus 2 divided by x plus 2 plus 2. Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. Now, 1 I can just write as 1 over 1. So now I know if I have a complex fraction, that means I can flip this and multiply. So this becomes 1 over 1 times x plus 2 over 1 plus 5 times x plus 2 plus 2. Okay, so this becomes x plus 2 over 1 plus 5x plus 10 plus 2, which gives me x plus 2 over 5x plus 11 plus 2. That does not equal x. So I'm going to go ahead and say no and move on to the next one. Okay, so the next section talks about we want to, for each function, find the domain and, and range of f, find the inverse, and find the domain and range of f of x. Okay, now if we remember to find f inverse, that means we switch the x and the y and solve for y. And when I find the domain and range of x, if I have a domain and a range, the domain and the range of the inverse should be flip-flopped. And we can double-check that with what we know about all of that. Okay, so let's see what we're going to do on this. All right, so for a... Um, let's see, f of x is 3x minus 5. I replace this with y. Oh, first I want to find the domain and range. Okay, so the domain of this function, this is a linear function, which is a polynomial, which means there is no restriction on the domain. Since it's an odd power, there is no restriction on the range. All right, so now I'm going to switch the, the x and the y. Okay, so I have y equals 3x minus 5. Switch the x and the y. x equals 3y minus 5. Add 5. Divide by 3. Okay. So my f inverse is equal of x is equal to x plus 5 over 3. Okay. okay, so now I need to find the domain and range. Well, I will tell you, this is just the equation. This is a linear equation of x over 3 plus 5 thirds, which is a line. Well, we already know the domain and range for a line is negative infinity to infinity. But my domain is whatever the range is from the inverse, and the range is whatever the domain was. Because remember, when we're flipping the x and the y, we flip all the x and y's, which means we flip the entire domain and the entire range. Okay, for b, f of x equals the cube root of 5x plus 7. All right, well, this is a, a cube root function, and there are no restrictions. If it's an odd root, then x can be a, any number. The radical, what the radicand can either be positive, negative, or zero, so there are no limitations on it. So my domain is everything, and so is my range. Okay. 
So I'm going to find the inverse of that. So let me just go ahead and take a couple of shortcuts here. All right, I'm going to switch the y and the x. So this gives me x is equal to the cube root of 5y plus 7. I almost goofed there. Now, I'm trying to get to the y. To undo the cube root, I take it to the third power, which means I have to do that on the left as well. So x to the third is equal to 5y plus 7. Subtract 7. And finally, divide by 5, and I get y is x to the third minus 7 over 5. Okay, once again, this is a cubic function, which it should be, because if it's a cube root, the inverse should be cubed. So f inverse of x is x to the third minus 7 divided by 5. Okay. Now we know again the cubic function goes on forever and ever in both directions vertically, no limits on the domain. Whoops, and this is range. But I also know that these are flip-flopped. So the domain is all real numbers and the range is all real numbers. Just this. Okay. 4c. f of x is equal to x squared plus 4, where x is greater than equal to 0. So they've already limited the domain for us. But this is one that you might want to think about it graphically. Alright, x squared plus 4 is just the quadratic function shifted vertically four units. But it's limiting it to x is greater than or equal to zero. So it's going to be this function here. They, the parabola goes this way as well, but we've eliminated it. We only want to look at this portion. If you do not limit the domain, there, this doesn't have an inverse because you can only find the inverse of a one-to-one. -one. Okay, but if I look at this function, whoops, and I'll just write it down here. The domain is what they gave us, so it goes from zero to infinity, and the range goes from four to infinity. So if everything works out right, my range for part three, whoops, let's see that. For part three, I should have a domain of four to infinity, and I should have a range of zero to infinity. So we'll do that and look at the graph and make sure. Okay, so I'm gonna switch this out. So for part two, I am now going to take, um, switch the x and the y. So x is equal to y squared plus four. So x minus 4 is equal to y squared. When I take the square root of both sides, I get y is equal to the positive or negative square root of x minus 4. Okay. But we have limited the domain, so we don't even need to look at this negative part. All right, now I think about the graph of this. If I know what the graph of a um, square root function is, then this is really going to make sense. This is the square root function that has been moved to the right four units, which means it looks something like that. And lo and behold, this function has a domain of 0 to infinity and a range, I'm sorry, of 4 to infinity and a range of 0 to infinity. So my f inverse is the square root of x minus 4. Okay, so d. Oops, let's see if you can. If I have f of x is equal to the square root of 5x plus 6. Okay. 
my domain on this function, I know this has to be greater than or equal to 0. So 5x plus 6 is greater than or equal to 0. 5x is greater than or equal to negative 6, so x is greater than or equal to negative 6 over 5. Now once again, this is the square root function, so my f of x is always going to be greater than or equal to 0 because it, since this has to be 0 or greater, the square root is always going to be greater. So my domain is going to go from negative 6 fifths to infinity, and my range will be from 0 to infinity. Okay, to find the inverse, now I'm going to switch the x and the y, so x is equal to the square root of 5y plus 6. To get it out from under the square root, I square both sides. So x squared is equal to 5y plus 6. Subtract 6 and I get x squared plus, oops, excuse me, minus 6 is equal to 5y. And that gives me, finally, that y is equal to x squared minus 6 over 5. Now, to see how this works, I can also write this as, whoops, and that's part 1. Okay, this f inverse of x is equal to x squared over 5 minus 6 over 5. This is the quadratic function that has been moved down 5 units, or 6, five, six fifths units. So, my domain, and we've limited it to x is greater than or equal to 0, So x squared over 5, this goes from, the domain goes from 0 to infinity. And I'll show you in a minute graphically what that means as well. And the range goes from negative 6 over 5 to infinity. Now to help this make a little bit more sense, graphically, let's see, 1, 2, okay. The original square root function is the square root function that has been moved to the left 6 fifths units. So that's just right there, and then it, it's going to do something like that. x squared over 5 minus 6 fifths, this one is going to be moved down here. And like that. Now sometimes it's harder to see on this, but with this kind of graph, this is still the reflection across y equals x. But it is undefined where x is less than 0. Okay, e, f of x is equal to 1 over x plus 2. Okay, for my domain and range, I know that this is the um, rational function that has been moved up two units. Okay, well, what does that mean? All right, well, that means I've got a graph of the rational function. <coughs> Button moved up two units. I have the rational function, since it hasn't been shifted left or right, I have a vertical asymptote at zero. And then my graph goes something like this. So for this function, my domain is everything except where it's undefined. 
So it goes from negative infinity to zero, and then jumps over and goes from zero to infinity. In my range, I have a horizontal asymptote at two, so this is negative infinity to two, and then go on and go from two to infinity. Okay, so there's part one, and that, so you can see that. All right, so now I'm gonna do exactly what I've done before. I'm gonna switch the y and the x. So for part two, I have x is equal to one over y plus two. So that gives me x minus two is equal to one over y. Again, I can turn this into a proportion and I can say y times x minus two is equal to one. And then if I wanna get the y by itself, I'm just gonna divide by x minus two. So this gives me y is equal to one over x minus two. Now the graph of this I know is also the rational function that has been moved to the left two units, excuse me, to the right two units. So it's hard to see if I graph them on top of each other, but I do want to show this to you. Okay, so I know it's been moved to the right two units. It has not been moved up or down, but my asymptotes have moved. So this goes here and here. So this confirms that my domain is negative infinity to two and then from two to infinity and my range is negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity and it is the flip-flop of the domain and range from the inverse. Okay, we're going to stop here. We'll pick up in a minute.